you don't know me, my name is Jim Mendoza. I am your junior grand warden. And my job here today is to talk to you about this new dynamic, if you will, that's happening within our lodges. Come on, here we go. You know, not long ago, my lodge read a petition from somebody who was born in 1995. Now, after doing the math to determine that he, in fact, was old enough, I came to a very interesting realization. This, brother, this, this now brother doesn't know what's life, what life is like without a cell phone. Doesn't know what life is like without cable TV. Has no idea what life was like without the internet. All right? It's an interesting, it, it, it's an interesting thing. And yes, my lodge, I will grant you, is, has, a younger, has a younger demographic. But even then, that particular scenario is not unusual to my lodge. I mean, you think about the people that you're bringing in, and yeah, the new people that you're bringing in are going to be that group of people. Quite frankly, that you know what, what they call the millennials are going to be the biggest population that we have coming into our craft, and we have to have a really good understanding how to deal with them. But not just them, but also the fact that guess what? We have the other generation still in lodge, do we not? So. You know, as I travel the state and I, and I look at that, I take, take a cursory look around, I see every generation. I see through traditionalists, you know? I see the baby boomers, both the front and the back end. And by the way, if you're wondering, I'm on what we call the back end of the baby boomer bus. Right? I've been on the back end before. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I've heard about that with you. <laughs> Remember, you're on video. <laughs> we have what we call the Gen Xers. And we have the Gen Yers or Millennials. Now keep in mind, they're all Masons, right? Every one of them is a Mason, but all have a different way of looking at the world and looking at the craft. And part of our job as Lodge leaders, both past, present, and future, is to effectively blend the knowledge and talents that each one of these groups brings to the table. And that begins first with understanding what makes each of these people tick. So. Let's start out with the traditionalists. Right? These were the people that were born prior to 1947. This is also known as our greatest generation, as has been described by uh, Tom Brokaw, right? Okay. What do we know about this particular group of people? Well, we know that their word is their bond. Right? This is one of the most. This particular generation is one of the most trusted groups that you will ever find. You know that if you ask them to do something, they will do it. You know if they tell you something, you know that they speak the truth, and there's nothing you have to worry about. At one point in time, all of our lodges just had traditionalists. So that was the whole demographic of of the lodge. The other thing, that, the other thing to understand about this about this group is that they tend to be the most reluctant when it comes to what we now call the traditional ways of communication. You know, yes, I grew up with face-to-face -face communication and written communication, but I have embraced the, the electronic communication world of email and social media. You don't see that too much. Now, I'm not, I don't want to generalize because let's be, I'll be honest with you, I know a lot of traditionalists who are really adept at, you know, in, 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 in the world of social, social media and in the world of electronic communications. But for the most part, they like receiving mail. Right? They like being able to read a, read a book, read a piece of paper, versus looking at a screen. So, they also enjoy the activities that have been accumulated over the years, have they not? And as Fred said, they tend to be resistant when somebody comes up with a new activity, even if the new activity is a regurgitation of an old activity. Right? Are, are you my questions now? or? I will, we'll get to that in the next thing, because right now, this is where you come into play. I want to know, and this is where the, this is, this is where the black pen and the, piece, and, and the piece of butcher paper that's on your, that's on your table are going to come into play. Take a few minutes. I want to know what is the best way that we can engage and involve, and you, again, use your own best practices, as well as ideas that come to mind, what is the best ways that we can engage our traditionalists? I'll uh, give you, what, five minutes? Go ahead, guys. This is your turn. <laughs> yeah. Because of the speed of advance of technology, is this kind of a new value for us? Like, is this a new tradition as well? Back in the 
just say right there. So yes, it's very hard to get a lot of the young guys to fuse in that. But those are the best guys to get them to fuse in. Really so, so I found out that I'd take them, you know, and then I started to with one of the brothers and they did. And eventually it got to where they were talking to us and they were sharing what they used to do. Or how okay. Let's see what you guys let's see what you guys got. So who is the let, let's see let's start here and let's start with little, little, uh, and, and let's start with Fred and uh, since you've got the pen in hand and let's see what you what, 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 what you what, what you guys came up with. Okay. Okay. Um. So talk loud because the mic so the mic can hear you. So that Mike can hear, Mike can't hear nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Educate, uh, engage and communicate two-way. Make sure your communication is two-way. And also, you have to remember that the traditionalists don't have email necessarily. So you, how do you communicate? You communicate by telephone or written word. They'd rather see a piece of paper than they would, you know, the email. The other way is use them as mentors. Use them as mentors for your, your younger Masons who, are, who maybe just received their degree. Let them mentor them. And that way, what ends up happening is you've got the traditionalist mentoring. The new Mason says, oh, I don't quite understand that. And all of a sudden, you've got this communication. You've got some education going on back to that mentor or to that traditionalist. Um, Educate, use lodge, uh, educate the lodge membership. Let them, let the old guy say, well, we used to do it this way in the past. Okay. Maybe now that the, the other fellows of the lodge say, the younger fellows say, well, did it work really well? You know, not a, not a conflict, but ask questions back and forth. And they said, well, how can we take that and, make, and now use it this way? in a new way. And I think you'll find it works out pretty well. And don't listen to the gloom and doomers. Oh, there you go. Thanks, right. Now, Fred, would you take that and pack that on the wall, please? And then, and then, and then get it, 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 you want me to be tacked? Yes, exactly. Yeah. One of the things we did is, is the same thing we do that on our modules. So obviously, we know those guys have been a long time. They know those books inside now. Another thing we did is, more table on discussions, you know, evolve, you know, sitting down with the other guys. Along with that, I, I found out when I first joined that there were a lot of older gentlemen who would show up half hour before dinner to have coffee together because they'd been there together. They'd been there for 20, 30 years. And so I started showing up with them because it's very hard to get when you got five guys, six, six brothers sitting at a little thing because we have our served by our youth for dinner. They're not going to get up. And so you can't scatter them, I guess I want to say. So I, I started showing up earlier. Me and a couple of the younger guys started showing, you know, younger than me, started showing up earlier and getting involved in those discussions with them. So that way, slowly but surely, they opened up and they, because I literally in my lodge, I, I had a few brothers in my lodge who were my mentors when I was in the MLA, and that's a long time ago. And so it's it's different. You got to get them involved in in getting them in your discussions. Okay, thanks. Again, yeah, same situation. Do it. Steve, looks like you got that. It looks like you got pen duty. Yeah, I don't get stuck with that. <laughs> you uh, showed up last. <laughs> just listening to the discussion at our table, I tried to synthesize it into, into two main points on engaging our, our traditionalists. Uh, the first is, and, and I pulled this one from personal experience with my mom, finally getting her to get her first cell phone, and, and then, like I told these guys, I, I wasn't, she wasn't ready for a smartphone, so we got her an iPhone. Uh, you know, kind of somewhere in between. <laughs> but, you know, she went to the point of, why do I need, even need a cell phone to, now she can't go anywhere without it. You walk by, what are you doing? Oh, I'm texting your niece. My mom texts, she sends picture mail. Because we demystified that technology. Integrate uh, our, our traditionalists with some of our younger masons, and, and bit by bit, well, how does that work? Well, here, this is how it works. And, Come on, I mean, some of our most inventive people came out of this generation. So once they realize that it's not going to blow up, then they'll jump right on it. You've got to demystify that technology. The other one is 
<clears throat> to really engage them, you know, everybody says you can't make the first mistake in masonry, they've all been made. Well, all of the situations we're seeing in one form or another have happened before. Engage these people. Get them to be part of the solution to any perceived issue. How did you guys deal with this before? And get them to pass that knowledge on and say, okay, well, here's where it's different. And they're going to come up with ways to modify that traditional solution and be a part of imparting their knowledge to your next generations and still feeling like they're a vital part of the lodge. And uh, thanks, Steve, again. Up on the, or take, if you could, Steve, if you would take that, tack it up on the wall and uh, grab a brand new one. You can grab a brand new one over there. And who's subscribed over this one? And I'm hey. sorry, my brother, you're one of the few people I don't know here. Uh, Hank Schaefer, I'm Alamanto, Lodge 46, House of Spokane. Hey, Hank. And going last, obviously, we've <coughs> already talked about what we had written down. Um, but for a traditionalist, so we've talked about the newsletter. Um, even though I would be considered the X generation, my mailbox is always full where I can't get any more emails because I don't like getting on there, do the work and everything else. So I prefer a newsletter that I can actually take out the mail and read. And so it's important that the, for people to donate money for the stamps and to have the newsletters going out monthly or however often you have that going out. Um, and communication is really big with the young Mason system. You have these older Masons that are just full of information and before all of our lodge meetings, we always have dinner before, and so I make it a point to shake everybody's hand that comes in the door and to sit with someone different in our lodge and talk to them because they're just full of information. And but we're all Masons, we're like-minded people, so big communication with our youngest people. And when I bring someone into the lodge and I tell them go sit over there at that table, don't sit with me every day, go sit with some of these other people. Um, like when my brother joined Masons, um, I told him, he's like, well, you know, he's, he's a very quiet person. I was like, well, you got to start engaging with people. Everybody comes in, you need to shake their hand, you know, make sure you introduce yourself to everybody. And then at dinner, before lodge, or at the dinner, you need to talk to sell with somebody else, sell with a different group of, of people, and communicate with them, talk to them, get to know them, and terminology, the words and stuff, because. Um, like we were discussing, there's different words and stuff in the dictionary now that people use. But communication is a big one to get to know your fellow brothers. Fantastic. Thank you. So, all right. So, let's talk about the next group. The baby boomers. This is, you can see, for the, these are the people born between 1947 and 1965. So this is a huge group of people here. This is what we like to call the show me group. All right. They don't want to be told anything. You got to show them things. You kind of have to guide them through the. You have to guide them through the process. Now, what also what's also interesting about this group is they want thorough answers. This is going to be a little different than the Gen X people that I'll talk about in a little bit. But they want thorough answers to the questions. You can't come back with, well, this is how because because that's how we do it. No, they want to know. Okay, why are we doing this this way? Because they're always looking for what they're always looking for process improvements. So be aware of that. The other thing is, this is the first group that started to embrace electronic communication. All right? This is the first group that started to embrace electronic communications. And actually, this is the group that actually helped to, help to you know, propagate electronic communications. Because, you know, your Bill Gateses, your Paul Allens, you know, all those people, they were born in this, in this time frame, this 1947 to 1965 time frame. So, my question to you is this. We've got, so now let's, so, so let's back things up a little bit. We've had this lodge that's been loaded with traditionalists. And now we're starting to see this baby boomer generation come in and almost, for lack of a better term, become the dominant force in the lodge. What do we do with that? Yeah, let's give, uh, so let's do this now. Y'all are switching tables, because I want the dynamic to change. So everybody find a different table instead, except for the person who's taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger than a 
Okay, so let's find out what you guys said. Let's find out what you guys discussed. Dan, what do you got? Things you know, we, we had is, is the boomer generation is always, they want to change. They don't want it to be the way it was for their dad. They saw their dads in World War II, they saw their dads in World War II, and they don't want to do that. So therefore, they always, they're raising their kids to a fact of, my, I want my kids to do better, be better, have better than, than we had the night grew up with. Um, everything's disposable. <coughs> got, we got to understand that. Is everything's disposable? The, the refrigerators, the appliances, the, the so therefore they, they look back and, and so we have to figure out a way to engage them. With, they look back at every don't throw things away in, in Mason. It doesn't work that way. It, it, it is the way it is because that's the way we've always done it. But they, we've got to figure out ways to entice them into keeping that flow through there. That makes sense. So yeah, and but they're they're more open to change. They're more open to oh I. I got to tell you, I, I paint in our lot. It was one of the first things I did when I came up. So I had some team LA, it was white, and that's all it was. And so I was put in charge of painting our lot, and you've seen it. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm here to tell you, when I had my mentors, when I was like, tell me I just made our lot into a cave. But to have the younger generation thinking that's the best thing they'd ever, ever seen, it, it's hard to, to move that change. Mm -hmm. Steve? Yes. What do you got? So not only the writer and the teacher. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dan, why don't you hang on a bit uh, until, we, until we do the table oh, switch? Uh, we, we, it gets kind of noisy with the, with the microphones. So the, uh, going off the, the talking points that you had about the baby boomers, the first thing is we're showing people. By the way, I did notice that every single one of the pictures you had on the groups has a DMLA in it. <laughs> and the only one that's older than me is Bruce. That's scary. Oh, you, you do. No, Carl, no, no, Ben Danders was up there. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> uh, anyway, so since we're showing people, what, how we're going to attract people into masonry and engage our baby boomers coming into masonry is live the life and walk the talk. we got to show them that we've got something special in masonry to where they're coming up to us and saying, what... Why are you doing this? Well, it's because I'm a Mason. This is what we believe. Really, show them what we're about. Don't no, just talk out. Once we get them in, how do we engage? Them? And and what we kind of came to the table, and we've said it in a few different ways. Get them involved in that nuts and bolts education. Why do we do our ritual the way we do it? You know, in a Saturday school or any time where you're mentoring somebody on proficiency. You ever notice, okay, well, why do we use these specific words here? And then you get your conversation starts going off into all kinds of different esoteric stuff about history and, and what things were like in, in that era when they came up with how they worded it. And then it devolves into our process. Well, why do we do it this particular way? Well, that's the way we've always done it. Well, what if we tried doing this instead, process improvement? There are certain things we can't touch. You know, the landmarks, the ritual, that kind of stuff. But some of that framework around it can improve with time. And innovation, I mean, some of our greatest innovators in history have been Masons. There's a reason for that. We're free thinkers. And getting them to be part of a solution, even if it was a problem we didn't see, is going to engage them and make them feel better. Whether anybody remembers their name two years later or not is insignificant. They can look back and say, I help make that better. Thank you. Hey. All right. Ours is kind of short. Um, I'll try to interrogate whoever 
that tradition falls in. So this is our big one here. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Clock Twin is pretty good to go on technology. So you know, it's up on the emails and social networking. Um, and we didn't see a lot of difference between our traditionalists with our baby boomers. So, so the mentor program there again is a big one um, to get, tap into them for knowledge. And we discuss uh, like a ride share type program because you have a lot of elder members in the Sonic Lodge that can't get to lodge anymore. So obviously if you live close to the person, you're going to pick them up. Let's kind of, you know, get our baby boomers going out and picking these people up, bringing them into the lodge and stuff because eventually they're going to be up there where the next generation down is going to have to swing up there and pick them up and bring them into the lodge and just it's a way of engaging them. Yeah. Well, now that I kind of look at it and think about it, there's not a lot of difference. There's not a lot of really, really there's not a lot of difference between the, tradition, the traditionalists and the boomers. I mean, essentially, yes, you have you have two different generation dynamics. But am I that quiet? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes, you have two different generational dynamics. But I think a lot of the ways that you would deal with the two integrations are the same. Um, again, mentoring. Use them as mentoring uh, brothers in the lodge. They're still going to have the knowledge. They're still going to have the wisdom and, and experience of life outside of masonry as well as within the lodge. Um, embracing progressive change between the two uh, generations. Um, integrating the, the old ways with the new ways. Trying to find that, that common ground, which I think will probably be pretty common amongst each one of these generations that we talk about today. Um, again, assigning duties and, and different jobs that they would be comfortable doing to get that um, a feeling of involvement within the lodge and appreciation, I guess. Thank you. Okay, so if you guys would pop that up there, and because the, this is, the discussion went a little bit better than I expected, I'm going to moderate the next two. <laughs> Okay, so, yes, Kip. You know, one, one thing that wasn't brought up in the one, um, I, think the, I think one of the main differences between the uh, traditionalists and the boomers is that most of your traditionalists are retired, and most of your boomers are working class. Mm -hmm. And that makes the difference of stuff you have to do a lot because all these people have jobs. Boomer, are you a traditionist? Can do things during the week. You're going to help a lot of her. Your boomers are not. They have to get home and go to bed, bath, and garage, and so forth and so on. So it's very, it's more difficult for them than it is for the traditionalists in participation. Yeah, I get that. So, Courtney. The idea was just brought up about, um, uh, about working. So let's talk about the next two generations together. First, we'll talk about Gen X. This, or, this generation was born between 1966 and 1977, and they are all in with, expect, with, with respect to electronic communication. Now, I know that's a generalized term that I'm saying that they're all in, but let's be honest. You know, this, I, you know, I, I'll give you an example. How many people who are working work next to somebody, I mean, literally, literally work right next to them and instead of going over them t and talking to you, they send you an email. Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, yeah. or they text. Yeah. You know? And they're texting each other, you know, that kind of thing. My wife texted me from the living room to the bedroom. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Couldn't have knocked on the door. Exactly. <laughs> this generation is the first to start talking in sound bites. You know? Whereas the, whereas the boomers were all about, you know, thorough answers, thorough communications detailed questions. This generation is all about sound bites, quick, you know, that sort of thing. Don't have time to complete it. Exactly. And then finally, with them, 
because of the fact that they do this thing, it's all, it's, it's all, it's got, because of their short, for lack of a better term, attention span, you've got to keep, you've got to keep the flow of information active. All right? You just can't throw one email out, one trestle board out, one phone call out, and expect that it's going to sink. You know, that's that old thing. It will sink, but not in. Yeah, that's the thing. You've got to remind, 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 remind. Now, in a similar vein, we look at Generation Y, which is the generation born immediately after them, and that's the generation we're dealing with right now. One of the, one of the similarities this generation is going to have with Gen X is that Despite the fact that, despite their youth and despite their inexperience, they bring a lot of technical skill and talent to the table. So as a result, you can't talk down to this group. It's really easy to say, because I remember when I was coming through, I remember one brother coming up to me and goes, don't worry, it'll come to you. That's not ah. And that's the wrong thing to do. Because you know something? People nowadays have choices. I grew, up in, I grew up in a time when the channels were 4, 5, 7, 11, and 13. Yeah, 13. Yeah, 13. You had more than you can? Yeah. yeah. See, see what I'm saying here? And you know, today, you, know, you, you, have, you have far many more choices. This is a group that, despite the fact that they said that, that they can come off sometimes flippant, they're actually very serious. They came to masonry because they want what we have to offer. And yes, they can be flippant sometimes, but they're very serious about this. And also, this is the first group that has totally embraced social media. But as a result, very much like the Gen X, they're used to sound bites. They communicate in 140 characters. But you know something? Their sound bites are even more truncated than boomer sound bites. Like, for example, remember the word see you later? Yeah. Now it's C ya L8. Yeah. Or it's C U. Exactly. So there's the, so so there's the thing. So my question to, to everyone in this room, and I'm going to ask this, I'm going to, I'm going to ask each table. We're bringing in this group. What are we doing with them? I'll tell you the one thing we shouldn't be doing with them, and then and then you guys can tell me what we should be doing with them. We shouldn't rush this group. Yes, they want to move through, but they don't want to come in as a candidate today and see you deacon tomorrow. And all too often we see that. And I I get there, and this is the response I get back. Yeah, but our lodge needs it. <laughs> And what I tell them is that you know, what you've got is a short-term fix, because I guarantee you he will be gone in two to three to four years. Okay. Because he's been he's been intimidated. So with that, what should we do with this group? Let's start with this table. Fred, you've done a great job of mentoring younger brothers. I know that, so what's that? Well, I think it's just to get them involved in the lodge itself. Uh, put them on a committee. Uh, include them. It's, it's an inclusive thing. And listen to them. Uh, you may have an older brother, a, a whatever, boomer, mm -hmm. traditionalist, whatever, in charge of something, but don't let him do it himself. You know, it's like I told uh, the fellow running the crab feed. I said, look, you're running this crab feed but I don't want you doing it by yourself. Tap, tap some of these other guys. And I got Derek here, who's one of the younger people in my lodge. And I know he jumps in when he can, but he's a working man. But utilize these younger guys. Keep them involved. Because they all have talents, and they want, to, they want to use their talents, but at the same time, you, know, you don't want to exploit their talents, right? Because they just, well, they'll run away, and they'll run away hard. So, Kenny. Uh-huh. What about you? What, 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 what are your ideas? I'm one of these baby boomer guys, but I work in high tech, so I'm going in different directions. And I work for Boeing, and we in five years, like 50% of the company is retirement eligible, so we're scrambling to get new people in. And it always surprises me to see younger people <coughs> in Boeing, because it's kind of weird. But we're dealing with the same problems of how to communicate with these guys. How do you keep them in a position where they're interested, where they're engaged? And as far as I can tell, it's just giving them something that they can succeed at. Uh, amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How about you? I'm sorry. I, I, I don't yeah. Eric? Yeah. Yeah. Talk to us, sir. <laughs> Talk to us, sir. <clears throat> um, for, I mean, obviously, I'm a generation wire, right? so. Oh, good. But the, uh, your perspective then is going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to me, it's, it's the simple things. Getting 
somebody from Generation Y involved in, uh, in the line early uh, and getting them to begin to think about that process. Because one of the things that I'll tell our newer members, and especially the ones that are my age, is that um, if you notice, the first station that you could possibly be in as an officer of the lodge, but not necessarily you could be in something else, but in general, if you start as a junior steward, you're serving others first before you get to sit in the big chair. And that's not a rite of passage. It is uh, it's, it's an honor. You're just serving in a different capacity in that particular time. So getting them involved and getting them learning the perspectives from the various different chairs, that, that went a long way for me. So um, being involved early and often. Yeah, so again, you see a common theme coming up, don't you? Get them involved, get them involved early, but don't inundate them. Right. Right? Because um, they don't know. Clark, your turn. Mark. Yes, Mark. From Newport Lodge, number 144. Uh, when I joined my lodge, uh, I was. I'm trying to think. I was well over 50. I'm uh, 64 now, and I just got a lodge member in that's uh, in his mid 30s. Actually, two members. You know, one is in the uh, enter the press. I can't get him to come to meetings because he uh, works uh, 100 miles, 200 miles away from home, and he's gone six days a week, and he's got a new child and a wife. <laughs> so you know what happens there when he does get home. Uh, I was. Uh, it took me a long time as a boomer uh, and being what I thought was the youngest guy in the lodge, and I found out that there was one other guy, and he'd already been the master of the lodge like six years prior to me getting there. Uh, so basically, I had a lot of old timers to ask, what, you know, what do I do next? And uh, then the next thing I know, I'm a uh, uh, junior deacon. At least one junior warden. Trying to get my, yeah, and you know, and trying to get my lodge rituals down uh, and the communication. And actually, they, those two young guys that are in their mid 30s right now uh, seem to be a hell of a lot smarter than you know, what's going on. They're more tech savvy about what's going on because all the rest of us are uh, from World War II to Korean War to Vietnam era. You know, trying to catch up to the technological world. Uh, but we try to get them, you know, involved. And I've heard before when I was at the, this conference a couple of years ago that uh, you know, the newest guy in, and like this gentleman here said about you know, being a steward, uh, give them a job. As soon as they get in, give them a job to make so they're not sitting there on their hands and everybody has said what we all think about uh, talking to everybody, uh, getting introduced to everybody when you come into Lodge. When visitors come to Lodge, get somebody, uh, get a younger person to meet with the new, or with the visitor that you've never seen before that's from some other Lodge. Because usually uh, what I've seen is that when visitors come, they're older, they've probably been a past master. Uh, luckily with, with us, we're right on the Idaho line so we'll get visitors from Montana and Idaho, uh, which is nice. And we've had some transferred in from as far away as Arizona. Mark, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move to that. So, but I think one of the things he brought up was that, that it was this. When you bring young people in and you evolve, guess what? Mentoring doesn't have to be old to young, does it? Nope. It can be young to old. And I think we forget that part. That, you know, yes, they're gonna come in with skills. You should allow them to teach those skills. You wanna get computer savvy? Get a young guy to help you become computer savvy. Listen to their input. Exactly. Richard, you had something to say. It's along the lines of what these last two guys said, but the big thing from my experience, I'm at, at Gen Axer, but I retired from the Navy a couple mm -hmm. years ago. We had the same issue. You know, we have a massive amount of young airmen, sailors that are coming in. What, how do we get them to go fix the airplane or go fix the boat or straighten the paint, you know? without having to explain 15 times why you have to do it. <clears throat> and the biggest thing that I found was that you don't want to over, over inundate them with something, but you have to give them something that they feel they're contributing. Exactly. 
And if you're not, if they don't feel that they're contributing, you will lose them, and you're going to lose them quick. Yeah. It doesn't have to be big, you know, as far as some of the traditional you know, I've been a past master, and you're serving breakfast. That serving breakfast can be enough for that individual, but it's on an individual basis. Great, thanks. I'm going to ask you guys to give me five minutes, because I'm going to go over. But I, th but I think, because I, I want to encapsulate what you guys have been saying. So regardless of whatever generation you're in, there are essentially four motivating factors that, that, that cause people to do what they do. So number one, they're going to learn something. All right? People come into Lodge and they want, and you're going to, because remember, what do, we, what do we say? That we're going to provide you a course of moral and symbolic instruction, right? Just a rhetorical question. How are we doing on that? Pretty well. Okay? Some Lodges will say pretty well, some Lodges will go, I'm still looking for that. Okay? Number two, that they will be given the opportunity to share their skill set. Remember what I said earlier? Mentoring doesn't have to be old to young. It can be young to old, you know, middle to, uh, middle to whatever, right? But you want to be able to, to bring their skill set to the table. There is nothing worse than somebody in Lodge that's eager to do something, and all they do is sit in the northeast corner until it's quote unquote their time. All right? You're gonna, that's the easy way to lose somebody. That they will be made to feel important. And that goes hand in hand when giving them something to do. And by the way, when, you, when they do accomplish it, thank you is always a good thing. Recognition is a good thing. What is it? Well, what's the phrase I've heard? It's amazing what people will do for, what a, what a soldier will do for a stripe of ribbon. Right? Inadvertently sometimes. Inadvertently sometimes, right? So yeah, do that, do that thing. And the last thing, and this is the interesting thing, because they have to. Now, I want you to understand something about this last piece, because they have to. Have to really isn't a valid reason for doing anything. But the problem is, we always tell people, it's your obligation. Yeah, I get the obligation part, but you know something? How about creating a want-to environment, where the brethren want to do these things because they see there's value to them? Not because you tell them there's value to them, but because you help, you cause them to believe that what they what why we do things has value. Like how many times have you heard of God? That's God. I got to learn all this stuff. What's that all about? And how many people say, "Well, I had to learn it, so you have to learn it." Yeah. That's the wrong thing to say. The right thing to say is because this is what we are all about as Masons. And if you commit this to memory, it becomes part of who you are. It becomes part of your life. And trust me on this one, it will make a difference in your life. If you come in from that standpoint, yeah, they'll be great. When you, can, when you tell you you have to do it, you got to create that want-to environment. So here's what I'm going to recommend that you do. First things first, think of your term plan as a buffet. You think, you know, you, you know, you've been to the Vegas buffet, right? Even the buffet we had here. Did everybody <laughs> here take something off, off, off every, everything on that table? No. no. You will pick and choose those things that are most interesting to you, won't you? And you know something? That's the same thing with, with your You've got all these diverse, you know, these diverse groups here. They're going to pick and choose those things that are going to be of most interest to them. And guess what? The people who support these things, who create these events, who, you know, who manage these events, they're going to manage and create and support those events that are of most interest to them, right? So have a huge smorgasbord of events, understanding that not everybody's going to go to everything, but people will pick and choose the things that are the greatest thing to them. Now, obviously, minutes and obviously meetings and degrees, that's something everyone should do, right? But, you know, those elective activities that you have, make sure that, that, that there's a broad both base for everyone. And again, remember, different generations have different ways of communicating. So don't, get, don't fall in love with one way of communicating just because of what is convenient. You know, trust me, it's fun writing a trust board. It really is. It's, you know, you get to be, there's just something about putting pen to ink or, you know, the tactile skill of typing on a, on a typewriter. There's just something about that where you can kind of play with your thoughts and then walk away from your thoughts and then massage them later. So here are your goals. You want to provide growth opportunities. Your brethren want to know that this thing called Freemasonry is important. You know, last night I, got a, I, I met with a brother, and he said, Jim, I need your help. I go, what do you need? I don't know anything. Could you be more specific? I will want to know everything I can know about masonry. So we had a nice 10-minute discussion about the various sources. Did you know that there's a Masonic YouTube channel? 
There's a Scottish Rite YouTube channel that talks about Freemasonry, and it's a great channel. The guys go, really? Did you know that the Scottish Rite has a Blue Lodge course of instruction? Costs 50 bucks. It's great. Try that. You need to understand the need for their significance. Remember, your brethren want to contribute in some way, shape, or form. And if you don't understand that need, guess what? They will, they will fulfill that need elsewhere. More dialogue, not less directing. The brethren will participate if they feel that they're engaged, not if they're being told what to do, right? You want to provide opportunities for, to fulfill the need for self-improvement. Brethren come to us for two, we've learned that brethren come to us for two reasons, fellowship and education. I've noticed that many lodges do really good on one. It's the other that they fall down on. So you've got to work on both. Again, you want to understand their motivating factors, why they're doing what they're doing. You want to trust. You know what that means? Delegate. Just because you're a workshop master doesn't mean you've got to do it yourself. Delegate. So, some final quotes to wrap, up, to wrap up our time together. Walt Disney said that when you blend old with new, you get new again. You ever been to Disneyland? It's not the same as it was when you were a kid, is it? No. It's constantly evolving. Though there are people who will tell you that Disneyland is perfect however it is. But it is constantly evolving. Somebody made the comment earlier that our most evolutionary people are, ma are, 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 are our Masons. So don't tell me that Masonry doesn't change. The second one, and I love this one. So here we have apple, and here we have orange. You know, remember Gus from my big fat Greek wedding? We are all different, but in the end, we're all fruit. In the end, here's the thing. We have traditionalists, we have boomers, we have Gen Xers, we have Gen Yers, but you know what we all are? We're all Masons trying to find the same thing. How we get there is what's different. But how we guide each other along the way is what gets us on the same path. So with that, I do want to encourage you to keep the dialogue open. If you do Facebook, send me a friend request. I will approve it tonight if you send it to me. I'm on LinkedIn. I have a professional profile on LinkedIn. If you want to link into that, knock yourself out. I have a Twitter account. Follow me on Twitter. Send me an email. Give me a phone call. I'm in, you know, I'm not, you know, not that hard to find, as Fred will tell you. <laughs> oh, and I have a blog. I have a weekly to bi-weekly blog that I, that, where I talk about my thoughts on the craft. And I encourage you to follow that and, can, and again, to share your thoughts with me. Because guess what? You might be surprised that your thoughts might be so compelling, I, may make, I might make you my guest blogger the following week. I've done that to two brothers already, and they've loved it. So with that, I thank you for spending your time. I know you've got another class to go to. If you have any questions, I'm easy to find. Thanks, my brothers. Appreciate it. Okay, everybody kind of sit toward the middle, and if you're sitting at a table by yourself, you're going to have to move. <laughs> we will be brothers whether we like it or not. He's looking at me. Don't make me pull. <laughs> oh yeah, you're gonna fall over. <laughs> Bill Cosby did, 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 tells that story about, about this uh, about how his kids said, "Drop me off here." Why? No, drop me off because I don't. Then he got to the point. Well, because we don't want to, we don't want to, our, our friends to see us walking because they think that, because they think we're rich. And Cosby comes and I'll fix that. Let me explain to you. You're not rich. Your mother and I, we're rich. <laughs> okay, like I said, if you're sitting by yourself, you're going to have to find a table where there's other people. Posse's coming in in just a minute. <laughs> a minute now. We have, we have less than 40 seconds. Find a table where there's other people.